Welcome to the Modern Hippie Podcast, where we'll be exploring all of my favorite boundary-pushing people and topics surrounding consciousness, psychedelics, mental performance, functional medicine, living in alignment, and so much more. I'm your host, Barrett Perlman, a former pro wakeboarder turned body worker, energy healer, and well, a modern hippie. And I'm so glad you're here. Welcome back to the Modern Hippie Podcast. I am here with Julian Gerderlei, and he is a catalyst of the regenerative movement, a breathwork facilitator and coach, as well as host of the Green Planet, Blue Planet Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Right on. Yeah. Thanks for the nice intro. You're welcome. German names are not always easy, so it's, it's all good. I'm, I'm super excited to be here with you. I love the title of your podcast. It's very intriguing. Oh, thank you. I like to, to be, you know, kind of a hippie, but kind of not more like a modern hippie. So, you know, right on. I love it. Yeah. I really struggled with the title because I was like, am I a hippie? Like, I don't, I don't know that I consider myself a hippie. I was like, but what does that mean to be a hippie? Um, and ultimately, I was like, I give up. I guess I'm a hippie. I I, the more I look at it, I'm like, well, I'm into taking care of your body. I'm into the moon cycles. I'm into astrology and crystals and connecting to spirit and agriculture. And I'm into mushrooms. <laughs> Very much so. so yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. And I feel like the, the, the associations and connotations with being a hippie are kind of not entirely what most people have signed up for. And so it's like, mm. yeah, like what's the modern version of that? Exactly. Uh, you're on the quest for that and listen. It's a- it's us, man. It's us. <laughs> right on. Yeah. How did you come up with the title for your podcast? I mean, you know, Green Planet, Blue Planet. I still sometimes stumble over it myself, but it was like an intuition. It was like, call it that. And then I was like, well, you know, with my internal voice. And I was like, well, that, that's a tongue twister, but sh- sure. And <laughs> a little bit into the journey, I, you know, I just really love the picture it forms in people's minds when they actually go there, right? Like, mm. so what does green planet, blue planet create in, in, in your mind, right? Like, let me ask, ask it back to you, Barry. Like, what do you see if you think of a green and blue planet, planet Earth? I, I literally see water and Earth, like the, the Earth from a zoomed out space perspective, and I see the land and the water. Yeah, and then ideally, maybe that planet can be in homeostasis and some kind of well-being or thriving mm. state. And so that's that was my intention. It was just creating a place. You know, it's three hundred episodes into the journey now, like five years, tons of amazing guests, and you know, a few accolades into the journey. I feel like that's really why I started in the first place. Is I want to have conversations about a thriving planet Earth and a thriving humanity. I definitely am aware that there's lots of challenges. I I don't have a problem to talk about challenges, but I don't want to get stuck in a lot of the PC um, dialogues that are limiting, I believe, us to think outside the box and to create new associations and to to find, you know, pragmatic solutions that are anchored in biology and that are like visible in the world and the nature around us. And that we as humans, you know, want to find our role in that biology, we want to find our role in that nature because we're part of it, right? We're, we're a part of nature, not, not externalized mm-hmm. from it. And so I think there's a lot of room to grow for us. What do you think is the spearheading solution that you've heard so far? Like the biggest tip that you could be a part of right now to bring about a better earth? Whoa. Uh, superlatives are always danger zone, right? Cause I'm going to, whatever I'm going to say is like, someone's going to be like, yo, but that's wrong. Something else is more important. Um, whatever comes to mind I'll first, take, you know, I'll, I'll take the, I'll take the risk. I, you know, I do think regenerative agriculture is a big part of it. Meaning, um, you know, we, we've largely seen a globalized effort on food production with heavy use of Roundup and pesticides across the world. And hmm. you, you know, excuse my, my, my language here, but you must be an idiot to still believe that that is the solution for global food production. Like it, mm. it just isn't right. We we're barely able to feed everyone on the planet like that, even though the planet itself, I mean, some people might not see it that way, but the planet itself really has enough of everything for way more than 8 billion people on it. 
mm. unless we pollute the planet heavily with Roundup and pesticides and GMO uh, induced seeds. And so I believe regenerative agriculture is a bit more of a, a, a localized or bioregional movement towards food production. There'll still be some global trade. There'll still be some some form of you know um, shipping in bananas from Ecuador to places that don't grow bananas. But I don't think that the whole system needs to be based on globalization or heavy use of pesticides and quite the opposite. When bioregions become autonomous and um, you know, able to provide food for all of their inhabitants and people and, and, and kind of create a homeostasis or an equilibrium in the, the, the give and the take of the ecosystem, then you know, planet, people and animals will, will all thrive. And so I think that's, that's probably the biggest pillar. Um, and it's not only easy to make steps towards that, but I think conceptually, anyone who does real research into that will see that that's one of the ways. And then from a place of embodiment, you know, it, it does require changing some of our habits. And especially in cities, it would be pretty difficult at the moment. Yeah. That's why I said, you know, having one solution is, is not always the, the way to go, but but it's a really good place to start. Yeah. And so you're in British Columbia in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Um, where do you source your food then? You know, mm -hmm. I know here question. we have like whole foods, we have sprouts, but are you farmers markets or bust or, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> farmers markets are bust. <laughs> no, not entirely. No. I, um, you know, I mean, I live on an Island and Vancouver Island has had a very healthy dialogue around food sovereignty for way longer than I live here. I moved here about 10 mm -hmm. years ago and yeah, it's, it's an ongoing topic. So farmer's markets for sure, you know, main, main stop in many of our, you know, weekly routine and people grow a lot of food here. We also do mm -hmm. get a lot of food from California actually. Um, so, you know, that's, mm -hmm. you know, maybe option B, but then yeah. also if you look at it from a larger perspective, I mean, California and global food export import, you know, it, it's, it's pretty far from most places, but BC to California is still somewhat within the same bioregion of the Pacific coastal, mm. um, you know, area. So it's not the entirely same bioregion. I, I don't want to be quoted for having said that, but it's, there are connections within, within different places. Right. And so, um, yeah, I still go to the supermarket, but I definitely okay. prefer to eat food that someone that I ideally know, or, you know, admire has grown in, in, the, in the soil. Are there a lot of people in Vancouver or Vancouver Island growing their own food right now? Difficult to say. I would say there are um, quite a few people that are doing this. Canada also has a really healthy culture of like community gardens and people, even in, mm. in Vancouver, which is quite a bit away from here. Um, you know, in the city, there's just tons of those spaces that exist. But really, it's more like a transitionary step. Like, I mean, the, the power and the might of the global food culture around, you know, um, heavy supply chains and like large costs and, and super globalization, that's still a really powerful player that, you know, unless it collapses, which it might, um, mm. it's going to be difficult for us to rethink it in the first place. Absolutely. But what if it collapses, then, you know, you do want to know your local farmer and ideally you have a plot of soil that you're cultivating. And so when you say, do a lot of people grow their own food up here? Well, you know, I have personally on and off um, been growing my own food. I definitely support farmers that do and, and friends that do. Um, but the funny thing in, you know, like westernized um, towns and, you know, same in Germany where I grew up, same in Canada is people invest shit tons of money into like a perfect English, uh, you know, cur cur um, golfing or lawn bowling uh, mm. lawn, right? Like it's like yeah. a perfect cut green lawn and you realize yeah. like, well, that's a pretty heavy thing to maintain, but then really it's horrible for the soil and what you're actually doing. Like you, you, you want to rather grow food gardens than lawns. And mm. I'm not sure how long it's going to take for that to happen, but, but there's, there's definitely a lot of British lawns out here. <laughs> that's so unfortunate. There are yeah. in California too. I mean, right now we're on severe drought restrictions. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm in one county south of Los Angeles now, but I know LA County is getting um, pretty dry again. And so that's a major, major concern for us. Um, where are we going to get water? 
in the next 10, 20 years, especially if uh, we keep having less rain and less rain. Well, you know, this is a, a this is a cool cool part of this conversation. You know, we kind of rambled into this um, this direction of region ag and and, and what it can mm. do. But so there's there's many examples in the world, and you know, the List Plateau in China comes to mind. Uh, actually, interviewed John Dennis Liu, who was also in the documentary Kiss the Ground, who talks about this and was part of this project. In Brazil, there's a few properties where that happened. That is really well documented too. You can actually regenerate land in mm. a way that you know allows waterways to come back oh, based really? on how you interact with the soil what you plant and in as little as five to 12 years entire waterways like literally water coming back onto land and properties has happened in several spots across the world where people have applied regenerative principles or agroforestry principles and um, wow you know it's mind blowing when you are on one of those pieces of lands and then you see the photos of like, it was like barren dry land before. And then, you mm -hmm. know, 10 years later, it's like, it looks like an oasis or like a garden Eden kind of scenario. And really the way we interact with land and um, like flora and fauna really matters. And that's what I meant with the movement towards becoming a, um, a player within the ecosystem rather than trying to dominate it all with, with pesticides and, you know, conceptual plans. I think this is really our journey forward. I would absolutely hope so. I mean, it sounds like not only do we get to develop a different way of doing things, but in doing so, almost give that hug to Gaia, to Mother Earth, and and breathe more life into her so that she can breathe more life into us. What a beautiful way to continue that symbiotic relationship of supporting each other. Um, that we've just gotten so far removed from that it's it's painful to see the true farming process and mm. especially animals, livestock. Um, those are things that I'm just like, ah, I can't. Yeah, animals and livestock, I, I mean, it's, it's a hard one to even talk about. But, you know, and like almost all of these topics, the, the most dangerous part i believe is when we have dialogues about it to get stuck in polarities of like this is right and this is wrong and therefore any anyone who says this i won't even listen to or whatever right so mm. polarities in general are, are pretty difficult places to come back out of um and it's very easy to manipulate people when they're in a polarity so i'm not saying everyone should stop eating meat even though i personally am a vegetarian yeah. you know, flex flexitarian at times over the years but you know at large very committed to that path now, I definitely also don't believe we should all eat soy and gluten-based alternative meat products. I think that's a, <laughs> somehow like a very interesting um, economical fad. Like I, I don't believe in those products too, too much because soy isn't really food, you know, mm -hmm. in that scale. However, plant-based nutrition, when you're actually eating plants, I mean, it, our stomachs are made for it, our teeth are made for it, you know, and it's, it's, it's also like the impact on the environment is... It's definitely a much, a much more positive one. But the, the truth of the matter is that the, the animal food complex that exists in the world is a killing machine. Like, mm. I don't really think a lot of people would eat as much meat as they do if they were to actually be present in how these chickens are living or how these cows are being slaughtered, you know? Right. Um, and so you're saying it like the way we're separated from the processes that happen in a globalized food culture where everything's just a thing that's a number on a spreadsheet i think that's what makes us inherently sick and there's lots of proof on that when you look at stats of how roundup has affected the the you know the biome of the planet and the biome of the people's immune system and so yeah it's it's a very deep topic and i know lots of people are now waking up to it and talking about it and you know, if you're planning to be around on this planet for the next 20, 30, 40 years, these are going to be topics you will need to understand or address or find your own way with. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's what, it, what is really important for me to say here on, on your podcast is not everyone needs to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, bioregion health looks different in every bioregion. But we currently come from a globalized mindset perspective where we're trying to fix everything like a number on a spreadsheet yeah. to make sure it, it does the thing we think it needs to do. And therefore we are making the whole world the same. You know, I, I, um, 
I hate seeing this because I love the diversity and uniqueness that every human brings to the game and that every area of the world, um, you know, creates as a backdrop for life. Absolutely. And so this is one concept, one area of regeneration. Um, what it does regeneration mean to you? What, what is it? I love that question. Regeneration to me is a principle of life mm -hmm. that's inherent in biology and observable in the natural world in us and around us. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in the biological world of the forest, the mushroom kingdom is largely responsible for, um, you know, the, the composting effect, the, the um, taking matter apart effect and then rebirthing it through soil into mm -hmm. whatever is blooming next. Now that is a life cycle, right? And the, the mushrooms in this example are just the agent of that change. I mean, way to pick um, my favorite topic to start with as an example. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> right on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mushrooms are our friends. And we need to learn a lot more about the mushroom kingdom because um, it's a kingdom, right? It's, it's not just mm -hmm. like another plant. Now, the mycelium, you know, if you're into it, psilocybin, like those are all things we want to really learn a lot more about. And so, therefore, that's what I'm saying. Regeneration is a principle of life. Now, it's not to nitpick around words, but it's not like sustainability that we mm -hmm. as humans are like, okay, we've got this economy running. How does it turn sustainable? Well, with the current metrics of industrial capitalism, it will never be sustainable because mm. the metrics and the parameters are based on infinite economic growth while exploiting a natural um, environment and so and people and so that's never going to really pan out to be holistic or healthy regeneration on the other hand is a cycle and again a, a cycle that is present in all of life and so as we humans are able to understand this and observe this my question is what's our role within it and then how do our social structures and our interactions and our culture progress over time. And that's when you asked me about, you know, like mm -hmm. the one thing with Green Planet, Blue Planet, I have had a few interviews around regenerative agriculture, but at large, I'm most interested about how our culture is changing, how our art is changing, how our art is inspiring regeneration, how authors and writers are inspiring this perspective and paradigm shift, because it is fully happening, mostly because we yeah. need to, because humans are turning more sick than ever autoimmune disorder is like at a rampant high, mm -hmm. um, you know, people like Dr. Zach Bush have mapped it out with the use of Roundup. It's, it's, it's very visibly correlated to what we've put into the water and the soil. And so right. the regeneration is the pathway forward in that sense. Yeah. So that's almost, um, I'm hearing like a little bit of biodynamic farming, but like blown out of the water. Um, cause I know that that's a concept that started showing up on like restaurant menus and products that you buy at the grocery store. Like I'm really into biodynamic wine. I would say like you could actually feel the grapes smiling, like happy cows shit on the land and made these like really happy grapes that were harvested with the moon. And, um, but this just takes that just up a, a bunch of more notches to really incorporate how we are as human beings in and around all of that. Um, that's, yeah, right on. Totally. That's great. Um, I see also a lot of like the psychedelic movement that's happening right now is something that's really going to be opening a lot of people's eyes more to helping the earth and healing the earth as more people tap into, tap into the mycelium, like literally, mm. uh, they're going to have this greater connection with the earth. And I mean, for me personally, I hope that that's something that, people take away with them that wow we are all one and we've been treating this earth like crap and what if now now that i feel so much more connected what if i do a mm. little more to help and the more people we have stepping up to do a little more to help um the more the ball's going to start rolling on that right on what I, are I really I, if I may, I'll just double down yeah. what you said about the psychedelic revolution or the, you know, medicine revolution. And, you know, there's, there's like a last threshold of indigenous wisdom embodied on the planet with in, indigenous mm. wisdom keepers at the moment. And, um, because of, you know, colonial colonialization and, and, and industrial capitalism, most of this is, is purposefully being eradicated. And, and, and the last strings of that have been, you know, are, are threatened. And so, our, you know, cultural 
and our you know wisdom uh, anchored in those cultural um, yeah kind of pockets of the world they're they're very very important for the the pathway forward of the human species like mm -hmm. this modern age is by no means as sophisticated as we were thought to, to believe you know and yeah. the wisdom is held within the plants and within in the you know cultures that have been able to evade um, some of the industrial progress that you know some of it is progress a lot of it isn't mm -hmm. and the reason i'm saying is that because when when you speak about psychedelics or plant medicines very much a part of my life as well in the right context in the right um connection to to healing modalities or to you know healing practitioners i believe they're really changing our consciousness to mm -hmm. to pay attention to things that we formerly didn't pay attention to. And once you start paying attention, you can't really unlearn that you understood certain connections of how life happens or you, that you ask certain questions like, why is it like this in the first place? Because most of the things we take for granted are like, they were invented by humans and some of them might not be so good. And some of them might only benefit a few specific groups of, you know, with monetary interests or whatever. And so it's our responsibility to wake the fuck up. And it's our responsibility to then say, what is it that I can do to contribute to the world that I believe in. And so for some of us, that means hosting a podcast for others of us. It means, um, you know, becoming a body worker for the next person. It means, um, to hold space for psychedelic healing for some of us, it means to do all of that, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's the, and there's many different things to do for some of us. It might just mean to continue to build homes and houses because that's your passion. And so it's really difficult to say there's one thing everyone should do, but, mm -hmm. With certainty, I can say when we start to pay attention to the regenerative principle, when we start to engage with plant medicines in a responsible way, we are waking up to a very similar um, kind of um, spark of, of wisdom. And I believe that's the nature principle itself. Amen. That is so beautifully said. Um, I just, I deeply desire to tap more into that indigenous spirit as well. Um, I feel like the deeper you go, the more that you get help with from the consciousness, from mother earth, from being tied in with all of it. You can live in this better rhythm that, that feels good. And there's so many people out there searching for a connection that our devices mm -hmm. have separated us from. And that connection lies in, in being more connected just to the earth. Like you can start there. I mean, get your feet on the ground, get your face in the sunshine, um, pay attention to the way the wind blows through the trees and look, mm. there you are, you're connecting with the earth right there. And, um, I think those are some really important principles that will help drive a, a happier society and, and a more connected society and one that cares more about this regeneration. Um, it's going to drive us all forwards. Mm. And so you, uh, work down in Brazil, you have a program down there that you work with. Tell me about that. Yeah. So Brazil over the many years that I've been, you know, a global nomad or, you know, living in different continents has <laughs> turned into one of my, my go-tos and one of my, my favorite places to, um, both learn, um, and, and, and also bring people together. Uh, my partner is Brazilian. So, you know, she brings me to that place uh, every year mm. and, uh, I'm super, super honored, um, but also just excited. I, you know, I went to Brazil for the first time as a teenager and in exchange year, I was in, in Paraguay for a year and Brazil and Paraguay share a border and was mm -hmm. in Brazil a lot. And so it's, it has a very special place in my heart, I guess, to just, um, start, start sharing that. And so for the last, um, few years, I've hosted several events in Brazil, the next one coming up in 2023 in March and April. And it's, you know, this, this next one coming up. Uh, is, is being hosted at a regenerative agroforest, a, a project called Terra Buma that has for the last eight, nine years created an agroforest um, based on principles from uh, Ernst Scotch and the, the you know, um, agroforestry, synergetic foresting. And it's, it's wildly, you know, it's just a bunch of words for someone who's never heard about it, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's wildly um, inspiring to be at a place like that, where these principles have been put into work and where 
over years, dozens of people have literally created forests and created food forests that, that feed not just themselves, but also their neighbors, literally. And so for us, it serves as a backdrop to um, host events that are all, uh, you know, anchored on the idea of lifelong learning and um, not all of the events, but almost all of them are also connecting us back to indigenous wisdom keepers and mm. plant medicines like the ayahuasca or psilocybin. And, you know, again, for the person that's ready for that, um, mm -hmm. not for, not for everyone necessarily. And it's, it's become a deep privilege and, and a responsibility to understand for myself personally, that this is part of my journey. And, you know, for a while I didn't, you know, I didn't even want to teach things like breath work. You know, this is like 10 years ago when it first showed up in my sphere and I made it an everyday practice, breath work and podcasting wasn't like it is today, like something <laughs> everyone knows of and everyone does, uh, at least according to Instagram profiles and mm. You know, fair, very fair. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing at the movement because I'm part of it. You know, it's, I still think it's amazing that it's happening, mm -hmm. but it took me a few years to actually understand, no, this is actually my thing to do and to offer as well. And I think nowadays, a lot of people want to jump into making money with something or making it their career really like so quick that I'm like, yo, did you even do this for longer than two years yourself before you're trying to share this with someone else? Um, you know, and anyway, I'm digressing, but it's, I think it's important to understand what is it that is yours to do and do this with the commitment that it, it, it takes to really birth something. And then some people are doing amazing at this and others not so much. And usually you can see by the results. Um, and so very similar for me to in, in working with indigenous people, you know, it's, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a white guy from Germany. And so mm. for a long time, I had to understand what it means to reconcile that. And, you know, I'm, I'm not U.S. American. I'm also not Canadian, even though I've been living here as a resident for a long time. So there's different things that were important in my journey of reconciliation, you know. And I'll, I'll jump to the result. I do believe we all are indigenous to this planet. Mm. However, our indigenous wisdom keepers, our brothers and sisters are telling the, you know, the younger brother, the, the, the white sibling mm. since many generations, like you guys have lost your way as indigenous wisdom keepers of this planet. Yeah. So in this generation that we're in right now, reconciliation and understanding the trauma of the past is an important step. It's culturally, um, different for wherever you grew up and forever, how your embodiment journey is looking. But it's also only one step. Another step is to re-understand yourself as a part of nature. Mm -hmm. And for that, you know, I have, I have not met a more effective teacher than psilocybin or ayahuasca held by um, wisdom keepers that have been doing this in their family lineage for a long time or that have been, you know, specifically trained for this. Be because it really, like, it opens your eyes in a, in a way that you can never forget again that you're part of nature. So true. So true. And so when you reconciled that you're a white German, were you struggling with the fact that your heart felt so called to this region of the world and yet you physically look like you don't belong and fit, like have that same alignment as, as they do? Or what, what was the hmm. issue for you that required the reconciling? Hmm. This is a great question and I'm, I'm glad we're talking about it because like my answer is, is definitely, you know, just my version of how I can share about this today. Um, I think at large, no matter where I went in the world, it's just, you know, so I'll, I'll back up. When I was 15, I, I, I think I said that earlier, I did an exchange year in Paraguay, mm -hmm. um, very close to the border of Brazil for a full year. I lived in a host family there. And when you grow up in Germany and you go to, to Paraguay or Paraguay for a year, like your worldview gets, you know, flipped on its head. Radically and shifted. Radically shifted. And so when I was 16, I returned to Germany and I, um, you know, had the bigger cultural shock coming home, actually. Hmm. Because I was like, well, this is fucked up. Like, how are we all doing this, pretending that it isn't running on the economical back of the southern half of the planet like how are we all pretending that we have these beautiful cell phones that we should get an update on every like year with the 
you know, the new version. Meanwhile, we're disregarding how, you know, copper gets mined in Congo or something, you know, like it's, right. and a few people are paying attention to this. And, you know, there are people eloquently writing about this, like Charles Eisenstein in, in his book, The More Beautiful World, Our Hearts Now is Possible. It's like, these are big conundrums that we have to individually understand and face, just like reconciliation is. But I can't help but be aware of it when I go to certain places in the world. Just like when I moved to mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest, which was me following my intuition, I couldn't help but notice how the British Empire was very successful in killing the indigenous cultures of North America. Mm. It's just, it's just what you find when you get here to the point where, you know, people that grew up in indigenous families in in, in the Pacific Northwest, wet Soviet land of, of Canada, what we call Canada many of them have forgotten their own cultures and traditions because, you know, th th there's been killing and culling and then there's been uh, residential schools to make sure no one remembers their language or gets physically abused if they do. Wow. And, and so these are realities that if we don't talk about them in our K to acknowledge how like of a downer, how big of a downer those topics are, then I don't think we can even be start to reconcile. And I don't mean so we can, blame or shame, right? Because who am I to talk about this as a, a German guy from Europe who's, you know, just had the privilege to travel everywhere. Um, but I do think we all need to find our own peace with those topics, understand what we can do, and then decide from there forward, how do we live in a highly paradoxical time? Because like, yeah, I have a cell phone and I take airplanes to go to places, you know? Mm -hmm. So someone else might say that's not consequentially environmental. And <laughs> I don't fully think that's how the equation works, you know, because I also think that regeneration um, has a much, a much, uh, much different take on that, right? Like, it's a very deep one. Um, but again, like other people have written about this even more eloquent than I can express it right now. So coming back to just the topic of reconciliation, you know, for me, for one, it had to do in school to face like the tragedy of Nazi Germany and you know the Holocaust mm. and all of this. And I traveled to Israel, I, you know, met many, many um, Jewish friends over the years and had some tough conversations, some conversations where I wasn't able to say an answer. And, you know, the, the, the weirdest part was when I traveled to places, actually, like in South America, where people would like greet me with like, you know, like, like, uh, like Heil Hitler. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, oh my God. Are you, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> you can't say that like, anymore. What's, 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 yeah. What's wrong with you, sir? Or, you know, and then you realize, oh, interesting. This is just like, a person who's trying to connect with you because they thought that you might like that. And you realize, wow, this world is so, well, everyone's hanging out in a different place, living yeah. reality from the place they hang out in. And so for me, it, it started as a teenager because when you go abroad, when you're early, when, you, when you're young, when it's early in your life, these things show up in a way that you are definitely out of control. Like you, you're like, what? Mm -hmm. You get really angry with some of my, um, exchange uncles and that year like that, that were part of my host family for saying things like that i imagine and that's how my personal journey of reconciliation started to reconcile the past that you know i have personally nothing to do with but mm -hmm. at the same time the lineages of humans on this planet do and if we you know for for us americans it has a lot to do with with um you know equal access and, and, and justice around, you know, uh, being an African American or being like a British American or whatever it is. And so these are topics that in each cultural group, people need to have like yeah. conversations people need to have. And I don't believe shaming, blaming, or just creating policies is the, the path forward. I really don't believe that. I believe it comes back down to making it a, like an effort of, of finding your unique expression with it and finding your way back to the natural indigenous person you are to the planet mm -hmm. and just finding your way to be of service to the world and others around you. And again, like I, I digress in those kind of questions because they're not easy questions and it's not an easy answer. And I'm super happy if someone's like, yo, what you said is fucked up and you're so wrong because I'm like, great. You know, I, I welcome that contrast because it's no one who's really deeply dealt with these topics themselves from their heart and in many interactions on different continents will resort back to shaming or blaming someone else because that person would have done their own reconciliation and is on the path of embodiment rather than 
pretending that there is like an, a conceptual um, perfect solution to it because mm-hmm. there very likely isn't, you know, and just to round this up, like in Brazil, because that's kind of what you asked about. It's, it's the same thing. It's a very, very highly complex situation. Very few Brazilians ever reconciled the way indigenous people were treated when the Europeans arrived. Mm-hmm. Very few Brazilians ever reconciled the racism against African Brazilians because it's a very, very diverse country. Mm-hmm. And some people actually ethnically do look like me. And um, yes. despite its, you know, beautiful diversity, Brazil has major problems with with shaming uh, indigenous people and with, you know, um, like racial inequality for for African Brazilians. And so it's it's an ongoing effort and you know, the best thing I can do just to point at like a piece of embodiment is to include indigenous wisdom keepers into my events to Mm -hmm. support places like Terra Buma that is working deeply with descendants of slaves, um, Kalunga people in Brazil and support people that are on the same path. Right. And have conversations that are sometimes a bit more difficult without giving up, but also, and I am committed to that, not getting lost in the polarity of political correctness. It's never mm-hmm. going to solve anything. It's not. Uh, that's a, a big topic. I'm a little passionate about <clears throat> yeah, as <that>. well. As <laughs> I uh, consider myself politically correct, but also at the same time, you know, if, uh, you have to know the rules to break them. And if you really do judge people, you're probably not saying things the way that I'm saying things or my circle are saying things. Um, but also to bring, bring light to certain situations. And so what an interesting experience you've had in Brazil, especially because I know Germany did a lot of exploring and colonizing South America. Um, for instance, I went to uh, Venezuela and we went to this like German town high in the mountains there that had like German beer and German food. And I was like, I'm sorry, I thought we were in the Caribbean. I thought we were speaking Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how interesting to, to run into that for you. But it's a reason why I think travel is just, it's so important. Um, and something I personally set money aside for um, every day to grow that travel mm. experience. And I studied abroad in Australia and one of the things that shocked me there was that Australians love to call Americans seppos. And the, yeah. it was a little bit where I was like, what do you mean seppo, seppo? And they were like, well, you know, cause Americans are like septic tanks. And I was like, we're like, what? And he's like, you guys just, you know, you consume everything and flush everything down the toilet. You guys are just full of shit. And I was like, oh my God, that's mm. legitimately how an entire country of people views us. Um, and the other thing they called us were Yanks because of the Yankees and fighting against, um, the rebels. Mm-hmm. And so and I was like, they, that's like, I almost took offense to it. I was like, I don't, mm. it's not really like part of our time anymore. Mm. Um, but not quite exactly what you experienced because wow, hail Hitler, that's next level. Um, for anyone familiar with that Especially history, if you're 15, right. Especially if you're 15 and, and you're like, you're like, what, what's going on here? But this is the same as, as in a way, it's the same as you hearing that person call you as Zeppos or, or, or Yanks. It's, it's these stereotypes exist. Sometimes they're, um, right ish. Sometimes they're just totally, you know, out of the blue wrong. But if we don't reconcile and, you know, I mean it as a verb in that sense, if we don't actively embrace um, the past and the things that have happened on this planet. And, you know, probably most of the history people know is only partially true because it was always written by the victors. So mm. we, we got to also pay a bit of attention to that. But, but you know, basically that's what reconciliation is to me. It's an active process that just happens when you're alive and you travel and you meet people from different cultures. You have to find a way to allow for a diversity of views and to also stand up when something isn't right. Like, you know, it's, as you said, it's, it's, you can't marginalize a whole country like this, or you can't say, um, you know, and I don't want to say the third time you can't say, you know, like a Nazi German greeting. You just can't like, I, I'll, I'll tell you to fuck off. Like it's, it's just not okay. You know? Yeah. And so these are the lessons that await many people when they travel. And I love that you said that like traveling by far, biggest way how I've learned in this journey so far, because it, 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 there's a newness and an exciting 
element of travel. So you're very receptive, you're very open. And then there is both like the high note of adventure and achievements and the low note of like being alone in the wrong spot or missing a bus or something mm. or a flight. I mean like, oh, now what yeah. I do? Yeah. So you have excitement, which makes you open, but you ha and you have highs, which, you know, keep you going and you have lows that you really have to deal with. And, and so, yeah, I highly recommend people travel if you're, you know, uh, curious to learn more about events that, that we're hosting. Um, I'm sure you can link them out in the show notes afterwards. It's, Absolutely. There's, there's a lot happening and there's a lot happening in South America. And a lot of what's happening in South America is fire, just straight up fire. Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, Peru in two months. And so I'm greatly looking forward to uh, this is my first calling to Peru and I anticipate there being many more, <clears throat> but uh, to go down there and spend time in the sacred sites, meditating and really getting to connect with um, some very highly spiritual places and then in get initiated into the land and um, do some plant medicines while I'm there. So ayahuasca and San Pedro, which I have not yet done. Um, very excited about. Um, when did you get called to plant medicines? It's a great question. Um, plant medicine showed up the first time around 2011, I believe, so like 10, 10 ish years ago, um, 10, 11 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, I was already in the process of permanently moving to Canada and to like the Pacific Northwest, definitely psilocybin, you know, Cannabis is also a plant medicine. It's just become a leisurely used plant medicine for a lot of people that right. where, where it's, where it's been legalized, uh, also places where it hasn't been legalized. And it's, you know, I, I've had my phases with that as well, where I think, you know, it was very medicinal. And then I had my phases where it was just like mm -hmm. me having too much of it. Right. It's a very different relationship I have with both psilocybin and ayahuasca or San Pedro was like, those are things that I really only do with very strong intention in a context that is either held by someone else or that is, um, you know, curated by myself to have this alone experience with myself. Like for example, some of my favorite, um, experiences with all of these, these plants is it's usually in circle with, mm -hmm. with someone else holding the space, right? Because it's, it's good to sometimes let the guy down and surrender, right? Absolutely. Other times I would take a small amount of psilocybin and go for a long hike. And, and then just enjoy that nature feels so much more alive and that, you know, I'm an intrinsic part of this beauty. Mm -hmm. And so there's many ways to do it. Um, I really always want to make sure I say that like, people like research, ask, ask other people, don't just, don't just do these things like a leisurely, let's take some shrooms and a party kind of, kind of, kind of deal. You know? <sighs> Yeah. Not my cup of tea. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, I'm like, okay, at least you're taking psilocybin. At least you're open to it. But on the other hand, like, ah, yeah. oh, that's just not the way. And that's yeah. um, one of my favorite responses I get from people who come to me for uh, mushroom ceremonies is that they, at the end of it, they look at me and they're like, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. I've been doing it wrong. And they're like, I need mm. the, I need the playlist that you had. I need you to show me how to mm. set the right mood. I need to, I, who knew you could go into it with intention and then lead into mm -hmm. it with a meditation and, um, just a, such a different experience than being around 10 to who knows how many other people in a large setting of just everybody on mushrooms. It's, it's a very different experience. And, um, and so did breath work sort of weave into your life around that same time or when did you get to the breath? Yeah. Breath work happened at, at right around the same time, actually a step earlier. So I went to India for the first time in 2009 mm. and, you know, kind of yo yoga was just something that, you know, it hit me really strongly in the body when, you know, I was exposed to it as a tradition and certain practices. And it was just like, wow, this is an overwhelmingly, positive, long lasting, positive effect. And so uh, it started with meditation and different breath holds, different pranayama exercises. And then um, before I even went really deep on the, the plant medicines, one of my friends, he was trained for almost a decade in Colombia as a medicine shaman, um, you know, shared a lot of holotropic breath work at the time. And mm. the first time I did that, I was just, you know, like life altering experience and just like being in touch with like the raw power that is available, um, you know, and the, the, like just the life force itself. And I realized, okay, so this is, 
this is something I want to keep, um, you know, a close relationship with both pranayama, which later turned into Kriya Yoga and different, different teachings that I was exposed to and I was, you know, initiated in, mm -hmm. but then also, um, holotropic breathing and more like shamanic breathing. And so for probably, you know, the first few years after that, I mean, till like 2016 or so, no, actually all the way till 2017, I didn't teach any of it. Um, so like the first eight years of me being exposed to those modalities, I didn't want to teach it. I was like, no, this is, this is something I do. This is something I practice, but, mm -hmm. but I don't need to share this quite yet. And then at some point, right around 2017, 2018, you know, I, I doubled down on the podcast and my consulting and coaching business. And, um, you know, I, I support and empower people to discover their unique gifts and talents and also to apply them in a way that work for them and create income. And right around then I had an inner voice that's like, you got to keep sh like start sharing some of these, these breath and meditation techniques that you you've learned, you know, that you've traveled to learn. And, um, so I started sharing it privately, you know, in, in, in sessions with clients at, at events, you know, in, in like small circles. And so this year, actually, I am launching a online course called breath portal mm. and it is it's breathportal.com. Um, it's, it's just coming out at the end of 2022 now. And, you know, it's a self led course. So, you know, if you, if you get the course, you can self, you can lead yourself through it. Um, it's more than 300 minutes of recorded different breath techniques from pranayama to qigong to kriya yoga to holotropic Wow! and it's like a summary of what i've learned over the last years and for me the most important part with breath work as it has become more popular in the last two years specifically is not everyone needs to do the same exercises and not everyone needs to do a two hour holotropic breathing on their back that has like past life trauma regression now mm -hmm. don't get me wrong i love that stuff Sometimes I do this and sometimes I teach this, but it's not the only way to do it. There's, there's a lot of different, you know, um, ways to connect to the space inside, to your body, to the oxygen levels in your body, to your immune system through breath. And so, um, me and my, my business partner in this venture, our intention, um, is, is to share different access points to breath breath awareness. And we call it the breath portal, because once you step through that portal of breathing with more awareness, your life changes. Yeah. There's no going back. No going That's back. It. Oh, how fascinating. What is the style of breath you probably put to practice the most? Hmm. Love that question. I don't know anyone that ever asked me that hmm. the style of breath I, I practice the most. Well, there's, there's two that come to mind. One is a kind of like a resting breath. That is something I apply when I'm actively listening to a partner, to a friend, to, um, you know, a client, uh, even, you know, on podcasts, when I interview people and mm -hmm. today I got to talk a lot, but you know, when you interview someone often you get like 10% of the conversation. And so what I do is I place my tongue on the roof of my mouth. I kind of, you know, lock in eyes to where I want to lock them in the po a point in front of you. You can do that without a person or you can do it with a person. Mm -hmm. And as the tongue touches the roof of your mouth, you close your lips and you just breathe nice and slow in through the nose, hold at the top for like a second or two, and then exhaling also through the nose. Ideally like Ujjayi breath for those who know what that is, you know, you hear this kind of rolling ocean wave sound of your own breath in the back of your throat or, you know, in your inner ear and it, it relaxes your nervous system. Mm -hmm. It gets you really present also. So it's a very simple thing to do while you're listening to someone because you're not trying to think thoughts while you're listening. You're just making space for what's actually being exchanged. Yeah. It's very useful. Yeah, it was great. Um, I, when I, I asked this question, I saw you take yeah. the, take that breath and I was like, oh, how beautiful uh -huh. you're down regulating your nervous system right now. This is just what an awesome response. Yeah. And you know, this <laughs> is, we didn't talk about this a whole lot, but like, this is one of your areas of expertise. It's so important that we regulate our nervous system and, you know, we, we live in a society that's bombarding us with external information from cell phones to uh, expectations around timelines and all of that mm -hmm. nonstop. And, you know, 
the television moved from the living room into your pocket through the cell phone. And it's, it's, it's just fucking crazy. Like we don't need to live in a world like this. It's really bad for our mental health. It's really bad for our physical health and it's really bad for our nervous system. And so I'm not a perfect example of that at all times, but I regularly catch myself and just realizing I need to breathe for a minute, like a microdose of breath mm -hmm. or for five minutes. Right. And slowing down your breath like that, it, it does the trick. It really does. And, and then there's many techniques like that that we're teaching in the breath portal that, that get you to the same place of just presence, awareness, and relaxedness in the body. My other favorite though, would be, it would be a different set of breath. It's more like breath of fire in yeah. Kriya yoga, which is, you know, pumping your diaphragm, um, also only through the nose mm. lips are sealed and you're just pumping a diaphragm for a minute, for two minutes, for three minutes, mm -hmm. certain hand holds or hand positions. And you're, you know, it's like drinking an espresso mm -hmm. through like a two minutes of active breathing. I love that. Yeah. We, uh, I just finished my breathwork facilitator training this past weekend. And so, um, uh, that was one of the styles of breath we learned, which is great. Cause I always feel like I'm lacking energy. And now I have this great two minute jolt that I can give myself and be like, Ooh, now I'm ready to go. We are warmed up and things are moving. Let's get with it. Right on. Yeah. That's the feeling. That's the feeling. Yeah. Exactly. I'm a big fan though, personally of, um, the holotropic and the psychedelic and the circular and the three part mm. breath. Um, because for me coming from this, this world of psychedelics and these grand plant medicine experiences, I feel like they give people just this delightful taste of what that space is like. Um, and, you know, especially if you're not ready for psychedelics and plant medicines haven't yet spoken to you, it's a great way to have a profound experience that can change your life, that can release those things that are stuck inside. And, you know, talk therapy is great, but it's just one part of this mind-body wellness triangle. And so to, to incorporate with the breath and move that energy and have this spiritual experience um, or mystical experiences is, is what's next. Mm. Do you get to guide a lot of those? Were you trained in holotropic specifically? Yeah, well, well said, actually, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, no, for me, like my background is in, in, in Kriya Yoga and meditation. Mm. And, and, you know, holotropic is one of the elements that I really enjoy as well. But it's not the main um, thing I usually lead with, mm. um, you know, and a lot of people now are. So I, I think that's, that's a great space to venture out in. What I wanted to add though, is that many people, when they have had many like different and out, like alternative uh, experiences with psychedelics or plant medicines report back, at, at least those are the stories I hear a lot of that breath is the central pillar of their experience in the mm. altered state. Because, you know, you're losing kind of connection to a lot of things that are usually really dear to your mind, but you're not losing connection to your breath. Breath right. is actually the one thing that carries you through all of these experiences. Yeah. Um, my first heroic dose of mushrooms, I took something like seven or eight grams. And um, I... Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, have had injury-induced asthma since the snowboard crash a few years back. And... Mm -hmm. Um, on that specific journey, I kind of felt my throat start to close up a bit and I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm struggling to breathe. And I'm laying down on this deck at my cabin in Guatemala, looking out at nature. And, you know, I had called in my spirit guide to be with me. And, um, I was laying there just sort of like, oh boy, what do I do? What have I done? And I felt him just sort of stroke my head and just go breathe, just breathe. And so I spent much of the journey just inhaling and exhaling and everything mm. was fine and everything was beautiful. And I, I mean, it was the most, I ended up getting a tattoo about it because it was such an impactful right on. part of my life. Um, but yeah, that you're absolutely right. That coming to the breath and sitting with the breath in those spaces is so important. I mean, breath is a medicine that we just have within us that can heal so many things and do so many things and give you so many profound experiences. Um, I'm really, I'm glad that I took the time now also to get this training and, and to bring that to my clients as well and share it with more people who everyone could use the breath. 
Um, I think my favorite that I practice the most is like a diaphragmatic breathing, just a deep inhale into the belly through the nose and exhale through the nose. Um, that's like my main go-to down regulating, mm. get present, drop in, uh, big, big fan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, this is, this is quite interesting because I want to make a, you know, like a, like a full loop to where we started this conversation, you know? So when we think about what is like, what is the best thing we can do for the environment or for the planet, or, you know, this is, um, and something along that line is where we started the conversation mm -hmm. right with the question. And there, there is just this way of thinking that our brains have been taught in school and also that we've been practicing through modern media and in modern society a lot that there's always going to be a fix. There's always going to be a solution. That's like ideally like a silver bullet that kills the vampire, you know, right? Or mm. like a pill, take this medicine and you'll be healthy. Oh, they have side effects. Take this other medicine and you know, keep going. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's, that's one way of, again, we've been indoctrinated and taught to think this way. So we, we all maybe have traces of that left, but when it comes to the breath, that's a very different way to connect and solve something because that's an intrinsically available tool. Mm -hmm. It's a very subtle tool. Now you can have some powerful, powerful, even psychoactive experiences with holotropic breathing. If you breathe heavily uh, in and out of your mouth for, you know, basically hyperventilating over oxygenating for, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes or longer. Mm -hmm. But it comes back down to, this is not something that you need to find on the outside, like a fixing thing, like a pill you can take or like the one solution. No, it, it's already in you. Yeah. It's as simple as breathing. We all do it subconsciously between 10 and 15 times a minute because mm -hmm. that's what our body does. And if you learn how to connect with that breath, suddenly everything changes. And I really, I really believe that regeneration is very similar to, it's already intrinsically a principle of life. Mm. It's already present on the planet in the natural world in and around us. And we as humans have the responsibility to connect to that. And when we do, things change and then our actions change and then our long-term perspective changes. And what we call nature, so the externalized part of nature, which is in reality, we're a part of, right? You know how when um, this whole COVID window started and like everything got shut down all over the world. And then within like three months, people were like, the natural world is recovering. Mm. It's like, yeah, no shit. Because the natural world is intelligently creating life nonstop, just like the breath is intelligently creating life. So if we stop throwing pollution and irritants on top of that, it changes rather drastically, rather quickly. Right now we can't stop everything we're doing on this planet, but we can stop a few things, you know, right. you know, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm digressing maybe a bit, but I'm, I do want to share this one. Like think of plastic, right? Very helpful in certain ways, for sure. Very pollutant in many other ways, mm -hmm. and especially single use plastic, the way we've just grown accustomed to make it, sell it, buy it, etc. But at this point, you know, I'd say we probably have enough plastic on the entire planet that if we just kept recycling it and molding it into the next shape that it should have, we probably didn't need to use and uh, didn't need to produce new plastic. So this is one of those many things that what if we radically just stop the production of plastic on the entire planet? Yeah. Now over the next 20 years, plastic would turn into the most like the hottest commodity because if you were able to find a piece of plastic from the year 2022 in like perfect condition, mm -hmm. you know, that might be worth a fortune <laughs> because someone is interested in molding that back and recycling it and making it into something else. Yeah. Now those, those are things that are not unthinkable. Actually, they just require more people to be on board and people to take massively bold action and not waiting for governments to regulate them for them. You may or may not know the answer to this question, but I, it prompts me to ask, you know, we have such a problem recycling here, at least in America, um, because it turns out they don't end up processing most of the stuff that we turn into the recycling plant. Mm. I mean, is there, 
are you familiar with anything being talked about that's a better solution than like everything has to be completely washed and clean before it shows up because otherwise we just can't recycle it. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, we're throwing away so much stuff that shows up at the recycling plants. Yeah, no, that's a problem all over the world. Okay. And that's, that's actually very real that, you know, most things still end up in landfills yeah. and, you know, with plastic, I, I might've been wrong with what I just said. And maybe, you know, it, maybe it does have to do with finding the right mushroom or the right bacteria that can eat and digest the plastic mm -hmm. again. Like, oh, I hope mushrooms you know, are this the answer. World, <laughs> yeah, this world exists entirely out of bacteria and, 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 and fungi and, and, you know, that's the realm we're in. Like we, we don't have to fear the bacteria of this world. We just have to understand which ones serve which purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what the pathway forward is, but what I'm saying is when we start to play with what's possible and we start to get really clear on what we just have to stop doing, right. Just like we talked about racism earlier or reconciliation, like there's certain things where the only answer is like, no, stop, not cool. You know? Yeah. And so that's very similar with, with the way we, we've just gotten lulled into like industrial oligarchical capitalism that like has a few people decide what's being done and a few, the same people bribe all the governments and all the multinational, um, entities to continue to have the merry-go-round go the merry-go-round as it has. And mm -hmm. that has to stop. I mean, again, you're going to be blind if you're not seeing this at this point and a little bit of research shows that. And so. I don't know all the answers or solutions, but you know, I'm, I'm one human doing the steps that I can do to, um, continue to contribute to a world I actually believe in. Amen. And if nothing else, we can all breathe. Just breathe. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, how can my audience keep up with you? Are you on social media? I know you and I connected on Instagram. What is your Instagram handle? Yeah. Yeah. So my Instagram handle is my full name. That's Julian Guderlai. And, um, I definitely love Instagram. I, you know, unless I get too many messages, I often get to reply to them all. Um, I have a website called greenplanet blueplanetcom uh, that's where the podcast is hosted on podcast is also on all of the podcast apps like Spotify, like iTunes, etc. Um, those are good places to start Breathportal.com is also, uh, just now being launched. I'm also on LinkedIn and YouTube and you know, all these other places. So it's not so hard to find me. Just put my name into Google, reach out. Um, I'm, I'm stoked to be in dialogue with people and Barrett, I would, I'd love to be on your show and to explore with you. I'm really excited to the journey of the modern hippie. Oh, thank you. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you and talk about uh, some more mind expanding things, some very hippie topics, but let's make more hippies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll have yeah. all of your info. Peace to everyone listening. Yeah. We'll have all your info linked up in the show notes. And yeah, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and review this podcast wherever you're listening. I'm so grateful to have you on this journey with me. Until next time.